in Theravada there's no teaching about Buddha nature. Sometimes you think it might be nice to have something like that, something you just fall back on and say that, well, no matter what, it's always there. But Theravada does teach us that the deathless is there in the mind, but we're not in touch with it. Because it takes work to get in touch with it. It's like gold buried under your house. It's nice to know that there's gold there, but you have to dig down to get it. Otherwise, it can't use it to pay the bills. An image they use in the forest tradition is it's like water in the sea. There is fresh water there in the salt water. But you can't simply let, take the salt water out and let it sit for a while and hope that the salt will settle out and you have nothing but fresh water. It takes energy to get the fresh water out. And so it is in our practice. It takes work, it takes effort. clean away the defilements of the mind, because so many of the defilements are the things that we hold on to close is our sense of ourselves, what we are, is all bound up in defilement, greed, anger, and delusion, centered on our bodies, centered on our feelings, perceptions, thought constructs, even centered on our consciousness. And these things don't wash away easily, you really have to have a well-considered approach. And there's a paradox here. It's the unenlightened mind trying to cleanse away the things that keep it unenlightened. Unfortunately, we have skillful qualities as well. And one of those skillful qualities is recognizing people who seem to have less suffering than we do. Things seem people who seem to be more solid in their happiness. So you listen to them, get instructions from them, and then you go and you try them out on your own. And it's a big job. You can't just take one technique and hope that it'll take care of everything. After all, the path has eight factors, and each of the factors has its own complexities. This is why there are so many teachings in the canon. Because as with any large job, the only way you can tackle it is to break it down into smaller jobs. Then you want an overall sense of the where you're headed. But at the same time, you have to really focus on the task immediately at hand. You can't just sit there and say, well, I'll just get in touch with my enlightened nature and then try to clone enlightenment. It doesn't work that way. The path is one thing, the goal is something else like going to the Grand Canyon. The road to the Grand Canyon doesn't look like the Grand Canyon, but it gets you there. And that's all that really matters. So you work at whatever steps are immediately in front of you, like we were sitting here and meditating. There are three elements of the path that we work on here. It's what's called the concentration aggregate. There's right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. Lying behind all of this is right view, so it's the beginning right view that gets you on the path. And you hope that eventually your concentration will get you to a deeper level of right view that will start cutting through those defilements. And the right view starts out with the conviction and the principle of karma, that the happiness and suffering we experience come from the skillfulness of our own actions. And the primary actions we have to watch out for are the ones in the mind. So right effort builds on this, looking for skillful and unskillful factors in the mind, and realizing you have a choice. That's what karma is all about. You have choices. We're not here practicing choiceless awareness. Choiceless awareness actually is a choice. You choose to sort of take whatever comes on, but there is that choice. So you have to be clear there is a kind of karma even in that. But before you can get there, you have to work on skillful qualities, work on unskillful qualities. And the right effort here is there are unskillful qualities that have arisen. Okay, you try to get rid of them. If they haven't yet arisen, you try to prevent them. As for skillful ones, 
Okay, if they haven't yet arisen, you try to give rise to them. Once they have arisen, you try to encourage them, develop them. So here are the skillful qualities of the, the factors of concentration. You direct your thinking to them, the breath, and then you evaluate the breath. How does the breath feel right now? Do you notice the way you breathe? Does it bring energy or does it seem to cut out energy? Does it bring balance to the body or does it make keep it unbalanced? Is it comfortable? Is it not? Is it just right for what you need right now? Now to see these things you have to have as continual awareness as possible. That's what the directed thought is all about, that you keep your thought thoughts and your awareness all focused on the same thing continually. If you find yourself slipping off, you bring it right back. Bring your awareness right back. You slip off again, bring it back again. That's right effort. As for thoughts that would pull you away from the breath, you can just put them aside for the time being. You don't have to pay them any attention. You don't even have to wipe them out many times trying to chase them down and wipe them out. It just pulls you away from the breath even more. Thoughts of that kind, if you don't pay attention to them, waste away. You starve them by denying them your attention, by denying them your interest. It's one of the most effective ways of dealing with these things. Now, part of right effort blends right in with right mindfulness. Again, mindfulness is not simply just watching whatever comes and goes and not making choices. It means keeping something in mind, and here you're trying to keep the body in and of itself in mind. That helps cut through a lot of distractions. It's the in and of itself that's important. Say with the breath, you keep aware of the breath energy in and of itself. Without thinking about your body in terms of the world, in other words. Is it strong enough for the work you want to do? Is it good looking? Do people find it attractive? Is it healthy? Is it not healthy? That's not your concern right now. It's simply just being with the body in and of itself. What's it like to experience the body in and on its own terms right now? Having that frame of reference helps cut through a lot of things, because otherwise the mind tends to go off into these little worlds that it creates for itself. It's almost it converts its experience of the body into something else. You notice how a thought can take up your whole head or take up your whole body. Because you've changed your frame of reference. Those sensations suddenly refer to the past, they refer to the future. And everything takes on a different frame of reference. And it's these worlds that we get lost in. These are the things that cause us a lot of trouble. The technical term is bhava, becoming. These things get created in the mind, and then you jump into them. It's like a car driving up. You jump into the car and don't ask where it's taking you. You just ride off. And then you find ultimately it comes back here. Well, you're tired of being here, so you jump into the car and ride off again. If you really want to see this process clearly, try to watch yourself fall asleep. You notice there's a point where you lose your frame of reference you know, in this particular body at this particular time. And a vision will appear in the mind. That's your first dream. You jump into it. There you go. This is why the process of awakening is called just that, awakening. You're, instead of falling asleep that, that, like that, you try to keep awake by being in the present moment. But again, that's the path. It's not the, the goal of awakening itself. But it's the path that helps to wake you up by just staying with this as your frame of reference. just the breath in and of itself on its own terms. And that becomes the theme of your meditation, theme of right concentration. In the beginning you just simply watch the breath, but then as you try to get absorbed in it, you work with it. What kind of breath would be absorbing right now? Would it be a deep breath? Would it be a shallow breath? Would it be long? Would it be short? Heavy, light? You work with a the breath. There's an element of willing in this. 
when the Buddha sets out the stages of breath meditation, it's only the first two they're simply observing. Observing whether the breath is short, whether it's long. And so from that point on, you will the various stages. You will yourself to be aware of the whole body as you breathe in and breathe out. Now this takes practice. Sometimes it's better to work it through the body, section by section, one at a time. So sort of work out the kinks in your breath energy. So everything flows smoothly together, so there are no interruptions, no obstructions. And as you work through the whole body like this, time and again, time and again, there comes a point where everything seems so connected that you can simply focus on one point and everything else connects at that one point. And that's when you have singleness of preoccupation, which is another of the factors of jhana. So you've got directed thought, you've got evaluation, and then you've got the ability to settle down and be one with the whole thing. And then you learn how to maintain that. Some people hit state of concentration, the next thing they want to know is, well, what's the next one like? What's the next one like? You have to really get to know these things well before you want to move on. Because it's the ability to stay with something for a long period of time. That's what makes the concentration useful. Because you see things a lot more clearly. It's like a path that you walk back and forth, back and forth, over and again, over and over again. You begin to know where every stone is, where every little footprint is, because you go back and forth over and over again the same spot. And then when there's the slightest bit of change, you notice it, because you're so familiar with the territory. The word jhana comes from a verb to, to burn, means jayati. Pali has several different words for burning, but this particular one is the one they use for oil lamps or anything that has a st still, steady flame. That's the kind of steadiness, the stillness, and the continuity you want to develop in your concentration. Because without that steadiness, without that stillness, and that long sense of familiarity with where you are, you don't see things clearly. If you keep moving around, well, it's like the whole world is moving around. And you can't differentiate what moves and what doesn't move. Because your point of view isn't still enough. It's like conducting an experiment. It requires very precise measurement. You want to make sure the table that the equipment on is on is very stable. Otherwise, the results of the experiment are worthless. So we are working here. We're working at developing a sense of ease and sense of stability. It may sound strange, working at ease, working at relaxing, working at settling in, but it's precisely what we have to do. It requires it's a refined work. It requires a lot of precision, and a lot of sensitivity. We talk about the steps and the practice, and it's even though they're written down and described in the books. A lot of it depends simply on developing your own sensitivity, your own powers of observation. So they're not just mechanical steps. It becomes more and more of an organic process where right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration all come together and allow you to see things as they actually happen, as they're actually happening here in the mind. Because the right view that sees through these things, even sees through the present moment into what lies behind it, requires a good, solid foundation. And that's what we're working at. Tranquility is something you can will. Insight comes as a result. You've got to get the causes right. And then the results come on their own. So work right here at the causes. That's what you're responsible for, and that's what gets the results. <laughs>